Church, how's everyone doing today? So good to see all of you today. As you see, I'm wearing glasses, so my son can be more comfortable wearing his glasses. So we, the sacrifices just don't stop. <clears throat> so I'm just grateful to see you all today. We had a wonderful celebration service for Ms. Ms. Ruth Roberts, who passed away last week, and um, was had an opportunity to to see the family. They left us uh, some beautiful flower arrangements. And just keep Dave Roberts in your prayers. And more than just prayers, if you know where he lives, show up every now and then. Um, send him a card. Cards are even better with a little bit of cash in them. So don't be cheap. Send Dave some love. Um, and just continue to check on him and the, and the kids. Uh, his daughter was going back to Georgia. His son was going back to Alaska. So we're praying for safe traveling mercies for for them. Grateful to see everybody today on this. Uh, I looked at the weather. It's supposed to be like 92 at some point today. So I'm not going outside. So I <laughs> would rather not bake on my day off. So um, uh, it is good to see everyone here. Also, thank you for those of you that are with us online. Give us a little heart in the uh, comment section. I will try to heart you back when I get the first opportunity. And with that, we go to announcements. Good morning. Um, let's see, a couple things today. Um, I want to start with the um, announcement around the offering of envelopes for 2025. Um, this is the last week you hear about it. So if you haven't already, let us know if you no longer want envelopes or if you would like envelopes and haven't had them in the past or if you want to change from weekly to monthly uh, or vice versa, please let me or Don Asley know so that we can get those ordered shortly. Um, let's see, that's uh, the soap making for um, the food pantry and for our uh, guests. That has was changed to this upcoming Saturday, the 21st at one o'clock. So if you can help out with that, um, that would be wonderful. Um, the update on the directory, we, we have been working on gathering um, information from everyone, and there is an accordion file, alphabetical, um, with pages, really just to review if, you're, if we have your correct information. There may be some missing information that we need to ha have you uh, complete and then sign so that we can uh, move forward with updating our directory. So um, if you... Just take a few minutes, look for it. We'll, we'll have a stack. We'll, 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 the ones that are completed, we'll, be, um, we'll, just, we'll get those into the office then. And then um, visitor cards are available now. We want to make sure that all visitors fill out the information so that we have a way of reaching out to you and welcoming you into our, uh, into our church family. So I oh, we have a couple meetings coming up. This is going to be a busy week because we do have our finance meeting, and we also have an ad council meeting this week. So um, that is also in the in the bulletin. So I think that should cover it. Um, with that, we're going to go into the call to worship. If you'll please join me, Holy Creator, we observe your magnificence in the heavens. As day whispers wordlessly today, the sun rises like a bridegroom, and nothing escapes its light and heat. You bring light to our eyes, making us wise. As we gather to worship, instruct us, command us, judge us, that our hearts might rejoice in your truth. May we do pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. And then our opening hymn today is uh, Be Thou My Vision. That's found on page 451 if you want to follow along. Thank you. 
Our scripture reading will come from Mark 8, verses 27 through 38. Mark 8, 27 through 38. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Cassia and Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The way of the cross. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God.
Beautiful, beautiful. Recurring question is, as we see in the Mark text, is who is this stranger who speaks with authority? Who performs the deeds that illustrates God's active presence in the world? Who is rejected by the religious authorities and misunderstood by his own followers? And finally goes his lonely road to the cross. Who do you say I am? In this moment, Jesus is asking his disciples a question, right? There are many moments where we can kind of toe the line a little bit, you know. Which one do you prefer better, pizza or a cheeseburger? Ah, you know, I'm kind of good with either or, you know. You ask the wife, hey, what do you want for dinner? Oh, you choose. Once you get a little bit older, you ask decisively, hey, babe, what do you want to eat, right? Because you know, she'll say she doesn't mind eating wherever, but you name some places and she'll say, no, I don't want that. Well, you didn't say, you should have said that to begin with. I'm confused now, right? See, Jesus is, is making sure that his disciples don't have an out. Who do you say I am, right? And he, and he gets them. Right? Who do they say I am? Right? Who do they say I am? See, the disciples know who everybody else says Jesus is. And Jesus has to basically get them in a corner. See, everybody, you know what everybody else says about me. What do you say about me? Who do you say I am? See, the time for neutrality and just swinging a leg over every fence, there are many days where those times are done. And you need to know when to bury your flag on the hill. And what does Peter say? You are the Messiah. Now, whether he believed it or not, you know, it's not up to us. We know what Peter said. Now, how many times have many of us done something out of necessity or because it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to say, and we may not have fully believed in it, but we did it anyway. Why? Because it was the right thing to do. Correct? It was the right thing to do. So Peter, as human as he is, and <laughs> Peter is one of the most human disciples Jesus has, Peter says, you are the Messiah. And for Peter to say that, that means something. Right? Same individual that denied Jesus three times, the same individual that cut off the centurion's ear, told Jesus, you are, the, you are the Messiah. But what did Jesus have to do to get him there? He had to make sure that he didn't, he couldn't choose neutrality. 
Decision is demanded, who do you say I am? Who do you? That is a direct question for the disciples. The thing is that this lesson is bracketed by the story of Jesus healing a blind man in Bethsaida in Mark 8, 22, 26, and another blind man, Bartimaeus in Jericho in Mark 10, 46, and uh, 40, uh, 46 through 27. During this period, Jesus is struggling with disciples who are blind to the truth that he would teach them. So Jesus is trying to show them hey, I'm doing this healing, I'm healing individuals who are physically blind to show you that you are spiritually blind to what is happening right now. I'll say it again. Some of us, we, are, we may not have the physical signs of it, but we are spiritually inept at a few things, right? We may be great readers of the word, but we may not be good doers of the word, right? You may have 20-20 vision in your physical, but in your spiritual, you can't see a doggone thing. Your common sense is out the window. The Holy Spirit can't talk to you to go give that person a few dollars or to give that person a ride or to say hello to somebody or to bring somebody a lunch but you can definitely see food with your physical eyes, right? You can see situations here and there, but when God's talking to you, we can't seem to hear it. You can hear, man, look, my hearing is ridiculous. It's terrifying, actually. I'm standing by the kitchen window, and I'm hearing a, like a simple scratching. And like, babe, you hear that? She's like, no. I said, listen for it. She's like, I don't hear anything. I said, babe, there's something scratching at the window. It's probably an insect. She pauses, turns everything off, and she's like, oh, yeah, I hear it now. I said, see, look, that's terrifying, right? I have amazing hearing. You know, it could be 2 o'clock in the morning, and if little man coughs, I'm sitting up like the undertaker. Just, what was that? And I have to make sure that my physical hearing isn't better than my spiritual. I have to make sure that I can hear the voice of God. And, 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 and that takes being decisive. And some of us, we're too neutral too, too many times. We don't want to shake the apple cart. We don't want to crack any eggs. But if you're going to eat the egg, you're going to have to take it out the shell. There's going to be some moments in your life where you are going to have to be decisive. You got to tell somebody, no, that is the wrong thing to do. No, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to return evil with evil. I'm going to return evil with good. I'm going to love my neighbor as I love myself. They may have done this this day, but I'm going to do this today, today, and I want to show them the love of Christ. No, I will not send you $25 on the cash app. You figure out how to get gas. Because some of us, we need to say no because we are enablers. We create the toxic uh, uh, attitudes and, 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 and motivations that, that are going on in some individual's life, and it's okay to cut some people off, right? that you have to say no to be able to do that. Where some of us were too, were too lukewarm, we're, we're too in the middle. Jesus healed two blind men back to back and his disciples are still struggling to make sense of who God is. Jesus is speaking clearly about what it means to be a disciple, a student of God. Right? In, in, this, in this, we're talking about being students of God. To be, to be a disciple, to be a follower, is to be a professional student. If you have someone around you who is a disciple, who is following you, who is learning from you, they are professionally learning. That is a professional student. And to be a disciple of Christ, we are, we, that means we take this, this learning from God to the next level. We are professional students. When you stop 
learning, you stop growing. When you stop learning, you stop growing. When Jesus told his disciples that his ministry would lead to suffering and death, he was sharing a basic truth about life. When we are dealing with the destructive effects of sin, victory usually comes only after pain and tears. Victory often comes after pain and tears. No cross equals no resurrection for Jesus. If Jesus doesn't go to the cross, he isn't resurrected. Right, So there's only one way this, this can end. There's only one way this has to end in order for the prophecy to be fulfilled, in order for what individuals spoke over his life before he was even born. Jesus had to go to the cross. What is the saying we always use? No pain, no gain, right? No cross equals no resurrection, no pain, no gain. And I can't blame the disciples, right? From what I have heard from pastors and individuals who believe in Jesus, they don't talk about the tears and the pain. They constantly talk about the victory and the glory. But in order to get to the victory and the glory, you got to experience some what? Tears and some pain. Come on, man. You ever sacrificed to be able to do something that you knew you were called to do and there was going to be tears and pain because it seemed like all of your buddies and all your friends were out there having fun, but you said, you know what, I'm going to raise my children. I'm going to be the individual that I need to be. I'm going to stick to this job. I'm going to stick to this career because I know this is what I'm called to do. And there's tears and pain, Right? There's sacrifice that needs to be made. Those are the conversations we don't have. Everybody wants victory, but they don't want tears. Everybody wants the glory, but they don't want the pain, right? That's the difference between being decent, being good, and being great. Jesus said, bring on the tears and the pain because I know what's on the other side of it. I don't understand where we got this old, graceful, tiptoe through the tulips Christianity from, but the Jesus I serve gave his life for me. And he did that through the cross. He was rejected by the elders. He was even rejected by a number of his disciples who followed him, who saw him heal, who saw him cast out demons, who saw him say things to individuals who could have got him killed, and his disciples still struggled to follow him. You think Jesus didn't have pain? While he is on the cross, he is looking at his mother knowing he is the firstborn and supposed to be taking care of his mom, and he gives his mom to his most beloved disciple so that he can finish the mission. Do you think that wasn't painful for him? Jesus endured the tears and the pain because without that, there is no victory in glory. Why do we want the victory without sacrifice? People crack me up with this happiness gospel. Like it's all cheerful and stuff. Man, if you read in the Bible, there's a lot of suffering in the Bible. A lot of suffering in the Bible. Shoot, Paul, close to the end of the Bible, he had to find cheerfulness in the suffering, almost gleeful while he's writing these letters to the church. Almost excited. Why? Because he understood the end result. He understood where he stood with God. He knew that he was right with God. So he was okay with the tears and the pain. He was okay with being locked up. He was okay with being chained up. He's like, hey, you got me in this dungeon while I'm writing these letters. I'm going to write them and read them out loud. And I'm going to convert the centurions, the soldiers that are around me. And they're going to send this letter off, and it's going to be part of a book that's been, that's been here for over 2,000 years. I'm gleeful because I understand the end result. Peter knew who God was. Paul knew who Jesus was. That's why it's important when Jesus says, who do you say I am? Because who do you say Jesus is? Because some of us, we got a clear-cut understanding of the politician we're going to vote for in November than we do for the Jesus that we serve. Right? You know the swing states. You know all the statistics. You know all of the adverts and all the rest of that stuff. But you can't quote a Bible verse to save your life. 
you don't know who Jesus is. And Jesus is asking, who do you say I am? Because whoever you say I am, that's who I am to you. Right? That's who I am to you. Who do you, who do you need me to be? Do you need a healer? Do you need a protector? Do you need a provider? Do you need a counselor? Do you need a savior? Do you need a redeemer? Do you need an author and a finisher of faith? What do you need me to be? Because I can be that for you. Jesus is asking, who do you say I am? And that's the price of a soul, right? Whoever wants to save their soul will end up losing it. But whoever loses their soul for the sake of me, not for the sake of Jeremiah Lewis, don't get it twisted, I'm not one of them pastors. You ain't, hey, you ain't, you ain't giving up your soul for me. I'm not carrying that. Right? You're giving up your soul for Jesus and the sake of the gospel, the sake of the good news. Right? I, I need some good news nowadays. I don't know about you, but I gassed up the other day, and it ain't getting no better. I need some good news. Right? <laughs> Shoot. I remember watching my parents gas up, and gas was 75 cents. Whew, to go back. Well, you can go into a gas station with a dollar and walk out with a bunch of stuff. You could almost, it's almost falling out of your arms, right? They made the Snickers bars bigger back then, right? You get a king-size Snickers, it's about as big as this, this right here. You get a king-size Snickers now, just don't get a king-size Snickers. Your fingers are going to get, your feelings are going to get hurt, right? I need some good news, man. There was a school shooting last week. I need some good news. I work in education. Two of my educator friends got threatened last week with gun violence, right? We need some good news. Come on, man. When we were last Saturday, when, you know, I, I wasn't in the office, I was at a family gathering, they asked for me because you know, can Jeremiah come? We really want Jeremiah to be here because I, you know, I'm always here on Saturdays. So I'm like, all right, I'll bite the bullet. Went to a family gathering, spent some time with my wife's family, little man, my wife in the car on our way home. We drove past that four car pile up. That four car accident that killed that young lady. She was the sister to one of my coworkers, three kids. And guess what the drunk driver, what happened to him? He lived. And she died. I need some good news. I, I, I need some, I don't, I don't know about you, like, I don't, but I need some good news. Because there's a point where you feel like you're suffering and the tears and the pain and you need good news to, so that you can endure through it, right? Life is hard. And we get moments of respite. We get moments of excitement. We get moments of joy. And then reality sets back in and we got to go back to it, right? So I need, I need some good news to keep me going because when I look around, it seems like I'm the only one that's suffering. Come on, I ain't talking to nobody. It feels like I'm the only one that's crying. It feels like I'm the only one that's going through pain. It feels like I'm the only one that's following the cross. And wherever I look, it seems like the most evilest individuals are getting over and they're having a good time doing it, God. I need some good news because I'm enduring and I may not see the fruit now, but I know one day I'm going to be holding the fruit of my sacrifice and my tears and my pain and it's going to be victory and glory. Amen. Amen. I know I'm talking to some people today. I know I'm talking to some people. You know, the saying, no pain, no gain, that's, that, that's usually involved with fitness, right? Individuals with fitness goals. There's another one. I, I, I love this quote. My football coach used to say this all the time. Pain is weakness leaving the body. I disliked it then. Still don't like it now. 
Because in many forms, it's the truth. Pain is weakness leaving the body. Because if you feel a certain type of pain, usually once you get over it, you don't feel it the same later on. Amen? Right? You have been heartbroken and you realize how to get over the heartbreak. Because if you know you, you do what you need to do correctly, you're like, okay, it hurt now. It's going to hurt a little bit later. But being able to understand how to get over it, if you ever burn yourself before, prick yourself on a thorn, why, why does pain not hurt as much anymore? Sometimes we, 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 we learn more, we learn more from the pain than we learn from the success. In life, we learn more from our failures than our successes, right? Because if you're always having success, then how would you know how to get better? So it takes failure. It, 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 it takes some, some missed opportunities for us to be like, hey, when that comes back around, I'm going to make sure to be better with that. So there are, there's tear, tears and pain. The missed opportunity of a conversation, the missed, the missed opportunity of apologizing, the, 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 the missed opportunity of doing something that you should have done, there's tears and pain in that, right? You know, when it comes to pain or pain is weakness leaving the body, that's fitness and health is involved, you know, in order to be fit and healthy, you have to have some suffering. Individuals who are serious about their health plan, they plan their meals to the point of some of these individuals actually weighing their food. Have you seen that? They have a scale on the kitchen counter and they weigh the food to make sure they get the calorie count. They're counting the calories, right? But they're serious about their fitness goals. I ain't gonna lie. A lot of them look good. Hey, you know, Y'all rocked up and, hey, how you doing? Like, man, I'd love to be that. I'm not counting calories when I'm eating my tacos from Taco Bell. Matter of fact, give me one more. While we at it, that wasn't enough. They weigh their food. They juice. They go to the gym. And you wonder why those individuals are few, because they're suffering. Right? You think they're having fun looking at everybody eat the stuff they wish they could? And they're just eating plain oatmeal and chicken breast that they boiled in the microwave, some hard-boiled eggs and a salad with no dressing? Guess what? They're suffering. They are. But they look good. Right? Skin's all nice. They got the pecs, like everything is just bah, 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 bah. And you know who's suffering too? The individuals that are eating whatever they want. Right? They suffering too. You got acid reflex. Your feet swollen. You can barely get out of bed. You feel sluggish. You're suffering too. And it's, it's amazing how one side looks at the other side and says, man, I wish I could be like that. But the individual that says, you know what, I'm going to be motivated. I'm going to take advantage of the day. I'm going to get up at 5. I'm going to work out. I'm going to make sure I don't have mess in my body. I'm going to stop drinking coffee later on at night so I can get some sleep. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Those individuals, they're few and far between because it's a cost to the suffering. It's a cost to the victory. And that's a cost many people don't want to pay. To wake up early. To work out. To see your kids Halloween candy and not just leave them the candy corn. No pain, no gain. My son be like, where's my candy at? I don't know. <laughs> I brought a bag of candy home the other day. Brittany took it upstairs and handed me the empty bag. I said, yo, I brought that for me. I mean, I didn't say that. I felt like saying it. If you know my wife, you don't, you know. <clears throat> there will be suffering. And Jesus asking his disciples, who do you say I am? He is asking them to come face to face with the reality of suffering. Because if you want to follow me, there will be tears and there will be pain. There will be suffering. If we look at Mark 8, 38 through 34, 34 through 38, 
when he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever, won't, whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Where fitness and healthy living are involved, that is for personal gain. This is where we differ as children of God because when we suffer, we suffer for the sake of the cross. We suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. The question is, do we know who Jesus is? Because our lives take on a different appearance when we know who God is. We know more about, uh, we know more about many specific situations than we do Jesus. But a poli politician can't stop the Prince of Peace, as stated in Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Why is knowing who Jesus is important? In the same way our children need to know who their parents are, we need to know who Jesus is. I'll never forget when I, hold, I held Kingston for the first time and I took a picture. I said, being a father is the greatest gift ever. And my dear friend, Mr. Buddy Berry from Maranatha, he sent me a text message saying, imagine how God feels. Whew, to the point. Imagine how God feels. Our children need to know our names, Right? God forbid they could get lost and need to tell the police who they belong to, right? Police, hey, who's your mom? Mom. What's your mom's name? Mom, right? Back in the day, you get backhanded if you call your mom by her first name. And I don't care what color you was, your lips was on the floor, right? Don't act like y'all ain't get spankings in here. <laughs> they think it's a cultural thing. No, it was a, you, you better behave is what it was. Shoot, don't make me come downstairs. Yeah. They need to know so that they can understand their lineage and heritage, right? That's why they need to know they need to know their parents' names. They need to know so that they can understand their lineage, heritage. They need to know so that they can know their identity and belonging. Who do you belong to? I belong to Howard Lewis. Where is Howard Lewis from? Howard Lewis is from New York, and my grandmother is part Mohawk Indian. That hey, look, my, my, who is your mother? My mother is Inez Lewis, Chillicothe, Ohio, One Lane Bridge. Come on now. Yes, country, yes, so that you can know your heritage, you can know your culture, so you can know who you belong to. They need to know so that they can know their identity, their belonging. They need to know that they are safe and they are secure for social interaction, emotional bonding, cultural heritage, self-esteem, and resilience. It's amazing how resilient a child can be when they know who they belong to. I come face to face with that every single day. I had a girl ask me Friday, can you adopt me? I said, can you adopt me? My kids are having a wild conversation, man. Look, fifth grade is a hoot every day. I'm on the phone with my wife in my classroom, and she's hearing this conversation, and we're laughing, because if you don't laugh about it, you're going to cry about it. That's what I believe. So we're laughing. And I don't know how it, it comes up, but, you know, we're talking about fatherhood and stuff like that. And, like, how many kids you got, Mrs.? I got one son. Oh, that's awesome. Do you like him? What does that have to do with anything? I, said, I love my son. Right? And one young lady's, 
Man, my dad must not love me because he left. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that hurt. Jeez. I said, well, you know. It... Another young man. My mom has eight kids. I don't think our dad's like us. I said, okay, hey, stop. We're not going to do this right now. Not going to ruin my day while I'm eating my sushi and drinking my pop. I had this conversation right now. A young lady asked me, <laughs> we're close to the end of the day. I'm, I'm, I'm putting a, a stamp on this Friday the 13th in the educational system. Y'all don't understand. It was crazy last week. Crazy. Then I'm picking the kids up, and the same young lady that says the pops ain't around, he don't like her, she looks at me, Mr. Lewis, can you adopt me? And I'm like, man, girl gone somewhere. <laughs> my heart just dropped. Oh, my gosh. I said, I can't adopt you, but I can be your mentor, and I can give you a bag of chips every now and then. It's the best I can do. Because one is enough, y'all. One is enough. That boy is, is terrorizing me. <laughs> y'all, like, try with four. <laughs> Five. I see y'all, some of y'all still drive the van because you just can't get out of parental duties. You just, you can get a two-door car. It's okay, right? Some of y'all still drive the van. You just like having the caravan feeling and looking back and just all the memories and stuff. No, I'm getting a sports car once that little boy get out the house. I don't care. I'm not y'all. Y'all are y'all amazing. <laughs> We are more resilient when we know who Jesus is, as stated in, uh, as stated in 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. We are more resilient when we know Jesus is our Savior. Amen. We are secure when we know Jesus as a protector, as stated in 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Amen. We are more decisive when we, we know that Jesus is our identity, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Who do you say he is? Is he your healer, provider, counselor, friend, deliverer, redeemer? And you need to be decisive about who your Jesus is. I know Jesus is merciful because I'm the cat that needs a second, third, fourth, and fifth chance. And my God is merciful enough to continue to give me chances and continue to believe in me. I know my Jesus is merciful. I'd have to, right? And in Jesus having mercy on me, I have to have mercy on myself, right? Because I'm one of the biggest critics of me. So I have to Make sure that my identity is in this merciful Jesus, because if not, the enemy ain't going to be on the outside. The enemy, it will be the inner me. So I have to understand Jesus is a merciful Jesus. Who do you, who do you say I am? Who do you say Jesus is? And if you can't bring a name to Jesus, then you need to figure it out. Because you, you're going to be calling on the name of Jesus sooner rather than later and rather have an identity because you looked it up and brought it up and, and are searching for yourself than you being in a situation where you have no choice but to put an identity on it. Right? I'm under the understanding that you either make time for God or God will make you make time for God. And that's not a laughing matter. There's many of us, we've been in situations where God said, okay, I'm going to have to make you make time for me. And we need to remember those situations so that when we can make time for God without God putting our arm behind our back, we do it and we understand that through the tears and the pain, we will see victory and glory. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we, that we understand who you are. 
that we have an identity in you. We understand that you are our, that our healer, you are our counselor. You keep us resilient, resilient, God, and we thank you. We are grateful for you today, that we know more about you than we do our political candidate, God. We, we thank you. We thank you. It's, 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 it's hard. It can be hard, God. But we thank you that we understand who you are. We understand the pain that you endured, the tears that were cried, and that we must suffer as well in order to gain the endurance, gain the understanding, gain the wisdom, God, in order to do what you have called us to do, which is be children of light. One of the highest callings anyone can have. You believe in us, Lord. And in return, we believe in you as well. We ask for all of these things in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn will be hymn 338, Where He Leads Me. Stand if you can. song. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Church, I love you. God loves you. There's nothing you can do about that. Make sure you figure out who Jesus is. Be the church. <laughs>